Pastor Patty, don't you love them? Thank you, guys. You may be seated. Thank you so much for having me back. It's an honor to be here and to be with all of you. I told the first crowd I love y'all's accent. It's really great. <laughs> People say I have one, but I think y'all have one. And uh, just a great church, great worship. I mean, I, I don't know if you know how great you have it here, but you really do have it great. And uh, it's just so nice to come to a place where people are so welcoming, so loving, and that you feel the Spirit of God here. And uh, I just, I commend you for that. My family sends their love to you all. And uh, I know this is a word church. You ready to get into the word of God? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it does not return void, Lord God. I pray that my words would, you, you would be pleased with my words today, Lord God, and that we would all leave here changed people, not because of a person, but because of Jesus Christ. Father, we just serve the devil. Notice that he'll not steal one seed of the word of God, but it'll go on good ground, and it will produce great fruit in Jesus' name. And if anyone here today doesn't know your son Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, I thank you, Father, that today will be the day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to encourage you with a scripture that you're familiar with, Jeremiah 29, 11. It says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. Aren't you glad he wants to prosper us? And not to harm us, plans to give you a hope and a future. Today, I just want to encourage you. I come from a long line of encouragers, and I'm just going to continue the tradition. Is that okay with you? <laughs> I want to encourage your hope. I want to encourage your faith. And I want to talk to you about this for the next few moments, that your future is bright. Your, oh, that deserved a better amen. Your future is bright. Everybody say, my, my future is bright. Now say it like you've had coffee. Now say it like you're from Texas. Oh, y'all sounded almost like me. <laughs> Your future is bright. God has a good plan. John 10, 10, one of my favorite scriptures is this. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We don't like that part so much. But Jesus says this, don't get me messed, mixed up with him. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The Amplified says to have it in the full to the overflowing. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of life that I want to have an overflowing life. See, as we all know, God has a plan for our life. We just read it in Jeremiah 29. He has a plan not just for our future, but he has a plan for every single day of our life. He wants us to prosper not only in our future, but in our every single day living. But on the contrary, the Bible says to be aware of the, the enemy's schemes. Satan also has a plan for our lives. And that's not to scare you. It's just to make you aware. If you have Jesus on the inside of you, you have the greater one on the inside of you. But Satan has a plan for your life. There's a fight over how your story will end. Satan does not want you to succeed, right? Satan does not want you to, to live out the dream that God has for your future. Satan's greatest fear is your tomorrow. He does not want you to have what Jeremiah 29, 11 says that you're going to have. So he's ultimately after your destiny. Satan does, does not want you to have what the Bible says you'll have. He doesn't want you to go where God says you'll go or do what he'll, he says you're going to do. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, Be well balanced. Be vigilant and cautious at all times for that enemy. Let me just bring it back just a little bit. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. Everybody say, at all times. You got to be aware at all times for that enemy of yours the devil roams around like a roaring lion seeking someone to seize upon and devour what I've discovered he he works at us in moments of our life where we've kind of let our guard down can I just be honest with you this morning can I be real with you this morning when we have our guard down maybe times like we feel a little bit discouraged Maybe times when our faith is a little bit worn, or maybe we feel like we've been stuck in a rut a little bit, and we keep just doing the same thing year after year, and we just feel like we see no progress. Or maybe it's times when you have thoughts like, you know, I don't really know if I can do what God's called me to do. I don't know if I'm talented enough. I don't know if I'm qualified enough. I don't know if God can use somebody like me. As Dr. Paul said, my uh, husband and I pastored a church for years in Arlington, Texas. And we kind of modeled our church the way that I grew up and my parents did Lakewood. My dad would get up and preach and then my mom would get up before him and she would kind of exhort the congregation for maybe five or ten minutes. So that's what we did in our congregation. And uh, I did it every week and I enjoyed it. One Saturday night I was at home and uh, I turned on the TV and it was like women's night and ministry on TV. 
I was all alone. All my kids were asleep. I was just enjoying the TV. How many of you moms know what I'm talking about? A little quiet time. I turned on, and, and there was this one minister. I mean, she was just going to town. She was quoting the word of God just like a machine gun, boom, 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 boom. She was so good. And as I was watching her, I thought, man, she's so good. I watched how the enemy starts working. I, I started thinking this. I wish I could preach like her. And I watched her a little bit, and then I turned the channel, and there was this other amazing woman preacher on TV. I mean, she was going to town. Not only was she preaching, but she was singing as well. And she had an organ to back her up. <laughs> and, you know, I started thinking, oh, man, I wish I could sing like her. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The Osteens do not sing. Thank God for that. We preach, but we don't sing. <laughs> But I started thinking, man, she's so good. I wish I had that in my messages, you know, singing and preaching. Watched her a little bit more, and then I turned the channel, and there was another lady. Oh, dressed from head to toe, just looking so good. She was just preaching a great message, but she had something more, and yet there's more. <laughs> she had some hand movements. She was going like this while she preached. I thought, look at those hand movements. That is so cool. You know what I started thinking? Man, I wish I had some hand movements. <laughs> Each person that I watched, although they were so good, I got a little bit more discouraged. Then I turned it one more channel, and there was Joyce Meyer, and I turned the TV off. <laughs> and you know what? I was discouraged, and pretty much that night sitting in my chair, I thought, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, I'm going to get up tomorrow, and I'm going to do it at church, but I'm probably really not helping anybody probably really not making a difference. I mean, they really don't need to hear from me up there. So I got up the next day in the first service, and I did my little thing, and I mean, it was okay. And then the, the sad thing is I tried a hand movement and almost dropped the microphone. It was really bad. <laughs> and I sat down that day, and I was so discouraged, and I just thought, you know, I am done. I'm not doing this anymore. We were sitting down, and then we started to sing another worship song, and I stood up. And as soon as I stood up, this lady came and shouted something right in my ear, right during the worship song. She said this, April, God wants me to tell you that you don't have to be like anybody that you see on TV. And I looked at her, her and I thought, were you in my living room last night? <laughs> and it was this lady at our church, and she was a normal lady. She was using the prophetic a lot. She wasn't a crazy lady, although she did scare me a little bit. And I looked at her, and she looked at me, and she said, God wants me to tell you that you don't have to be like anybody else in your family. I thought, thank God for that. i got a lot of preachers in my family. And then she looked at me straight in the eyes, and she said this, April, God wants you to know that he created you for such a time as this, and he wants you to walk in the calling and be in the destiny that he has called you to be. You know what, folks? I wasn't discouraged anymore after that. But the point is this, the enemy rarely ever misses an opportunity to bring disappointment. He rarely misses an opportunity to bring discouragement. You know, if he can trigger something while you're down, oh, you know what, you're not really good enough. You're not really talented enough. You know, if he can cause you to worry or cause you to lose your joy, what he in essence is doing is getting you to, to be distracted on your today so you don't even think about your tomorrow or your future. you got to be aware of the enemy's plans. Growing up, I used to hear my dad say often that he had went through a time in his life where he felt like he failed God. And he would say it in his messages, and you know, I, in case you didn't know, I'm the youngest of the Osteen, the youngest of five, and in case you really didn't know, I am the favorite child as well. <laughs> Just ask me. <laughs> And I used to sit and I'd hear him, you know, say that story and I'd hear how he'd say he had a nervous breakdown and he felt like he failed God and he quit the ministry and he went into the insurance business and he was successful in that. But he never said anything more and it wasn't until about, man, about 10 or 12 years ago that I heard my brother preaching. I was actually listening to him. <laughs> and I heard him connect the dots for me and he had, I found out later that he had asked my mom for permission. But he was telling the story of how my dad quit the ministry. And I knew my dad had been divorced before he ever met my mom, but I didn't know that was the reason why. And Joel brought it all together for me. He said my dad went through a divorce that he did not want. He was a pastor, active in the pulpit, and he went through a very unwanted divorce. And all the bo although the board let him stay on as pastor because of the situation that took place, he felt like he wasn't worthy. He felt like he wasn't qualified. 
he felt like he had failed God. Have you ever been there? And you know what he did? No one else took him out of the ministry. He took himself out of the ministry. He disqualified himself. He thought, surely God can't use anybody like me that's messed up like this. Thank God that he came to his senses and he realized God does not use perfect people. God uses available vessels. Amen. See, folks, God is for you. Don't be against you. If you think about the people that God used in the Bible, he used perfectly imperfect people. Thank God for that. Let me remind you who he used. He used a prostitute, an adulterer, a liar, a thief, a widow. He used a stressed out woman. All the women said amen. An orphan, he used a murderer, he used a beggar, he used a blind man, a suicidal man, a demon-possessed man, a donkey, and a dead man. I think he can use all of us in this room today. Amen? If God used them, he can use us. No one is excluded. Guess what? Nothing disqualifies you from being used by God. Nothing puts you in a lower class. Nothing, God doesn't look at you and say, no, you know what, you're on the other side of the tracks. No, God is not like that. Nothing it lessens his plans for our lives. Thank God for that. And nothing that we do today or we can ever do will ever get him to stop loving us. You know why, folks? Because God doesn't pick people the way people pick people. That's kind of fun to say. God doesn't pick people the way people pick people. Thank God for that. See, in God's eyes, you are a keeper. You are a blessing and not a burden. You are accepted and not rejected. Somebody told me if If God had a refrigerator, my picture would be up on it. God loves you. Amen. He loves you unconditionally. You are a blessing. Everybody say, I am a blessing and not a burden. My youngest daughter and I, about two years ago, were going to the store to get some Christmas uh, gift bags and some wrapping paper. And we went into a store that was right by our house. It was the dollar store, and we had never been in there before. So we went in, and we were just loading up. She, we had the basket in the middle, and I was putting, you know, bags in and wrapping paper in, and we were just loading up that basket. And I started getting a little bit concerned because I thought, this is going to start adding up. And I was looking all over for the price of these item, items. Like, I thought, you know, there's, I don't know how much these things are. My bag is overflowing with things. I'd never been in the store before. Finally, my daughter comes over, and she said, Mom, I can't see any prices on these things. <laughs> I said, I can't either. This is the weirdest thing. They don't put prices on bags, on wrapping paper, you know, not even on the little tag where it's holding. And and we were just like bewildered, could not believe why does nobody put prices on these items. I was just about to go ask the cashier, thank God that I didn't, thank God for the grace of God. (laughs) And all of a sudden, you know what I did? I looked up. And all around the parameter of that story, you know what it said? Everything is a dollar. I found out y'all have them here too. I had no clue, and we looked, and she looked up, and we were like, no way. And we looked in our basket, and this is seriously what I did. I picked up a little bag, and I said, now, maybe this one's worth a dollar, but this big one, it's got to be worth more than a dollar. Maybe this wrapping paper, you know, maybe that's a dollar, but no, there's no way. It was crazy because we wanted to pay more for the items that were in our basket when this, the sign clearly said everything is a dollar. You know what, folks, how many times do we do that with the Word of God? God, I know you said this promise is for me. I know you said I have a wonderful future and a hope ahead of me, but God, I've been in prison. God, I've been married three times. God, my children aren't serving God. God, I've been an alcoholic. I've been an addict. God, I'm barely off of this, just a few days sober. God, how can it be for me? You know what, folks? If you have God, if you have Jesus in your heart, all of the promises of God are for you. Nothing disqualifies you from his plan that you, he has for your life. Amen? See, it's not about what happened to you. It's about who happened to you. So let me encourage you, stop disqualifying yourself. Amen? Don't get stuck in a moment. God does not see you as a failure, but as a learner. Thank God for that. And you know what? Right now your life might be a mess of money. But you know what? Soon it's going to become a testimony. So don't give up during the hard times. Let me give you some truth here today. If you think things that are going to, if you think things in your life are going to be terrible and awful and painful, can I tell you something? They probably will be. 
Because, see, your, your mind believes everything that you feed it. So maybe it's time we start feeding our mind faith, feeding our mind hope, amen? Feeding our mind truth and love and grace and mercy and life. Your future is as bright as your faith. Get your faith up high. Isaiah 43, 19 says this, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. I love that. See, if God desires to do a new thing in your life, let God be God. Let God do a new thing in your life. Don't get stuck in a rut. When my dad passed away in 1999, um, my dad was, you know, he pastored, I don't even know how many years, over 50 years. And he was in the ministry over 60 years. And so my brothers and sisters and I, we all worked for my dad, but none of us had to get up in the pulpit every week. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves without the patriarch of our family, and not only that, but the pastor of the church. And just to give you a little bit of behind the scenes, um, it, my dad died at 454 on Saturday, January 23rd, 1999. And in the hospital room on the TV at 5 o'clock, they were announcing about my dad's death six minutes later. And not only that, but they followed the announcement about his death up with a story that gave statistics on how if a son or daughter took over a church how it would more than likely fail not the most encouraging news you want to hear right there i was nine months pregnant two months away two weeks away from having my fourth child and not only was i sad that i'd lost my dad but you know what i was heavy with how are we going to do this we cannot fill that man's shoes i mean he's been in the ministry so long we're just a bunch of punk kids trying to do life here how are we going to do it? It was so heavy on me. And I was so stressed out about it. And then I, we were getting the statistics everywhere, how it's probably going to fail. And I have to say, it was moments of discouragement, moments of I didn't know how it was going to happen. And one night I was laying in bed, and I think I was asleep, and I believed that God gave me this dream. I dreamed that my brothers and sisters and I and my mom on the end were all standing barefoot. And in front of us, all of us each had our own pair of shoes. And mine were really, really cute. God speaks through me through shoes, and I love that about God. He knows me. <laughs> I told the first crowd, you know, the children of Israel's shoes did not wear out. God has a thing for shoes as well. <laughs> so there we were, all of us barefoot, and there were shoes in front of each one of us. And, April, and, and God said this, April, you know what? You don't have to fill your dad's shoes. None of y'all have to fill your dad's shoes. Your dad's here in heaven with me. Everything's good. What I want you to do and each of y'all to do is just take a step and put on those shoes that I've placed and designed for you and walk the path and journey that I have planned for you. Amen. I love that because we didn't have to be who daddy was. We didn't have to carry on the ministry exactly how daddy did it because guess what there's different people and they have different personalities so don't get stuck in a rut don't do things simply because they've been done for 15 generations before no let god use the unique individual that he has created you to be when mom and daddy um, received the baptism in the holy spirit in 1958 my sister was born with something called cerebral palsy something like cerebral palsy and through my dad getting into the Word of God, he was a good Baptist. God bless the Baptist. He was a good Baptist minister, but in his denomination at that time, they did not believe in healing. They believed if it was God's will, they would be healed. And so mom and daddy had my sister, Lisa, and um, she had no sucking reflexes. She couldn't move. She just, she just sat there. And the doctor said she'll, probably, she'll never be normal. She'll be in a wheelchair. She'll probably never talk. And so it was at that moment that my dad got deeper into the Word of God, and he began to read the, the, um, the Gospels, and he saw how God healed sick people. Jesus healed sick people. He saw how he raised the, the dead and how he caused the blind to see, and the, he caused those that couldn't hear. He opened up their ears. And then he got to his scripture, Hebrews 13, 8, that said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And suddenly it clicked. And he said, you know what, God? If you healed a man in Bible days, and you did, then you'll still heal today because the scripture says you will. Through that experience, my mom and dad received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So they pastored a Baptist church in Baytown, Texas, and they decided it was time for them to go across town and start their, another church. So that's what they did. So they went across town, and they, this was long before I was born, and they bought a feed store that actually fed chickens. There was holes in the ground. 
and they put a sign up on the outside of the church that said this, Lakewood Baptist Church. Why'd they put it up? That's what they were familiar with. That's what they were used to. One night, a few weeks after they put that sign up, a storm came through town and blew the word Baptist off. True story. Daddy took it as a sign from heaven, and the rest is history. That's how it became Lakewood Church. See, folks, sometimes God is trying to blow something out of our lives because it's not for our future. We need to let go of what he wants us to let go of, and we need to walk in the path, the new path, that new thing that he's trying to do in our lives. Amen? So be open to God writing your story. Be open to God doing a new thing in your life. God will never ask you to let go of something without replacing it with something new and improved and so much better. Amen? And have you discovered this? God does not need Holy Ghost Jr. Amen? He doesn't need us to help him out with our future. He just simply needs us to obey and walk in the path that he has for us. Everybody say, my future is bright. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking away from all that will distract and to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. You know what? Sometimes we just need to stop in life and the overwhelmingness of life life's stresses, life's troubles, life's happenings. And we just need to stop and we need to readjust our focus. Amen? You know, focus will make you or break you. It will set you up or set you back. And it's what you focus on that becomes magnified in your life and it's up to us where we aim the lens. You know what? Sometimes we just need to take a pause break and remind ourselves of the kind of God we serve. Amen? You know what? Can I take just a moment and remind you of the kind of God you serve? Can I encourage your spirit man right now? Is that okay with you? Okay, this is the kind of God that you serve. You ready? You serve a my God is able kind of God. Oh, that's good. It's okay that I like my own preaching. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself. You serve an exceeding abundantly kind of God. You serve a nothing is impossible kind of God. You serve a no eye has seen, no ear has heard kind of God. You serve a, oh, I like this one, help me walk through the valley of the shadow of death kind of God. You serve a not going to burn in the fiery furnace and not even going to smell like smoke kind of God. You serve a part the sea kind of God. Stop the raging storm kind of God. Raise the dead kind of God. Heal the sick kind of God. Set you free kind of God. Oh, this is good. You ready? You serve a ain't no grave going to hold him down kind of God. Amen. You serve a, if he said it, he's going to do it kind of God. His word will not lie kind of God. His word shall not return void kind of God. Oh, this is really good. You serve a, you ain't seen nothing yet kind of God. You serve a, get you out of any mess kind of God. Get you out of debt kind of God. Get you a better job kind of God. You serve a, listen to you mamas, you serve a hedge of protection kind of God. You serve a restore a marriage kind of God. Never give up on the prodigal kind of God. Save your children kind of God. You serve a never leave you alone kind of God. I'll stop and tell you this. When my brother, my oldest brother was young, long before I was born, he was scared of the dark. And at night he would call out to my dad and he would say this, Daddy, are you there? My dad would call back at him and he'd say this, Yes, Paul, I'm here. In a few minutes, Paul was not satisfied. He was still a little bit scared. And in a few moments, he would muster up the courage and he'd say, Yeah, Daddy, but is your face, is it turned towards me? My dad would call back and he'd say, Yeah, Paul, my face, it's turned towards you. See, you serve a God whose face is always turned towards you. Amen. You serve a never stop loving you kind of God. You serve a God who is leaning over the banister of heaven and he is cheering you on. Remind yourself of the kind of God that you serve. Psalm 118 says this, whenever you find yourself doubting how far you can go, just remember how far you've come. Remember everything you have faced, all the battles you have won and all the fears that you have overcome. You know what? You can do this thing called life. Amen. You know what, I think it's time that we start getting our words working for us and not against us. I think it's time that we start talking about our blessings instead of our burdens. 
I think it's time we start talking about the good that's going on in our life and not the bad that's going on in our life. We have to be careful how we're talking to ourselves because we are listening. The words that you speak become the house that you live in. Proverbs 21, 23 says this, keep your mouth closed and you'll stay out of trouble. Hey, if you don't have anything good to say about your present situation or your future, just zip it up and that'll be okay. Amen? Don't talk yourself out of the future that God has in store for you. No matter how bad things we can always make, how bad things are, we can always make them worse. We got to be careful, amen? The choices that we make by accident are just as important as the choices that we make on purpose. You can't always change what's going on around you, but you can change what's going on within you. I told you last year about my mom, and I always speak of her because she's a memorial stone in my life. In 1981, she was given a few weeks to live by the doctors. She had a grapefruit-sized tumor on the inside of her. The cancer was so far spread, the doctors looked at my dad and said, Pastor Osteen, your wife has a few weeks to live. When I saw my mom, as I told you last year, she looked like death. That's all I can say. She looked like death, 82 pounds. And it's amazing because during that time in her life, and I'm going to relate this in just a moment, during that time in her life, I was the only kid at home, and I watched what she did when bad things happened to good people. I watched what she did when, when somebody who didn't deserve that went through such a bad thing. And I watched as she would go through the house being so sick and so much looking like death, and she would say with her mouth, Father, I thank you that I'll live and not die. She'd say, Father, thank you for the sunrise that I see today. She says, Father, thank you that I'm able to be here with my husband and my daughter, my favorite daughter. (laughs) Maybe I added that in. (laughs) She would constantly go around and thank God for the things he's done. Thank you, Lord God, that I'm able to get in the car and go to church today. Thank you, Lord God, that I'm able to to see another day. Thank you for the breath that I have today. And, And, you know, I don't know what was going on in her mind, but I know what came out of her mouth. This is what I want to relate it to. See, the future that God has in store for you and the fight that you get to that future, it doesn't only impact you, it impacts generations to come. Because now I can look back at my mom like it was yesterday and I can think, you know what, something really bad happened to her. But you know what, she loved God anyway. She spoke highly of God anyway. She didn't just practice it from the pulpit. No, she practiced it from her bed when she was so sick at home. She loved God in the good times. She loved God in the bad times. And you know what, folks? The way you live and believe and pray and act and respond and give, you are setting future generations up to experience the goodness of God. You've got to realize it's not just all about you. Every time you don't give up, you're making it easier for your children. Every time you sow mercy and sow kindness, you're storing up mercy and kindness for your children. Every time you speak life, you are making a difference. Every time you get back up after falling down, you're teaching your children to be a get-back-upper. Every time you try again after you fail, you're teaching your kids that God gives multiple upon multiple chances in life. Every time you make a decision, Make a decision to trust God no matter what. You are impacting and affecting your bloodline. Your children and your grandchildren will remember how you walk through the fire. Walk well through the fire. Amen? Inheritance is what you leave to someone, but legacy is what you leave in someone. Live a legacy that God can be proud of and your children can follow. Let me sum it up by saying this. The enemy doesn't determine your destiny. God does. Amen? You might see difficulty, but you know what? God sees destiny. Don't get worried. Get ready. God is about to do something new in your life. Amen? (laughs) Always believe you are on the verge of a miracle. Keep hoping. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep faithing. Keep it looking up. Keep reminding yourself of the kind of God that you serve. Listen, sometimes you got to go through the blah season to get to the aha season. And I decree and declare that your aha season is coming in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word, Lord God. Father, I thank you that you have a bright future for each and every one of us in this place. Lord, I pray if anyone walked in today thinking, Lord, you know, I don't really, really deserve this. I'm, I'm not really worthy of this. I've messed up too, too much. I've had too many failures, Lord God. Just pray that 
supernatural eraser will take that out of their very being, Lord God, and that you would infuse them with destiny. You would infuse them with joy. You would infuse them with a, a great future and a hope, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, anyone who feels like they're too far gone, like, Lord God, that you would just remind them that in your eyes, they are the apple of your eyes, that you love them unconditionally, and nothing they can do can separate them from your love. Lord God, right now, as every head is bowed, I'm just going to ask if this is okay, Dr. Paul, if I ask if, if anyone is here today that doesn't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, I just want to make sure. And you'd like to give your heart to God today, or maybe you say, April, I, I've served God, but I haven't been serving Him like I should, and I want to rededicate my life to God. I just want to make sure. If that's you, raise your hand. I see those hands. If you just keep them in the air. We're not going to, we're not going to embarrass you or anything. Just keep them in the air. Oh, so many hands. It's so good. Anybody else? Say, so today's a day I want to make a change in my life. Okay, with your hands up, and if everyone would repeat this prayer with me, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my heart today. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean, Lord God. Lord God, I declare today, Jesus is the Lord of my life. I'm starting a new beginning, starting fresh with you, and Lord God, I thank you that my greatest days aren't behind me, but they are ahead of me. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. I love you.